Today we continue in our sermon series of knowing scripture to change our future. And today we're talking about, won't you please be my neighbor? Won't you please be my neighbor? That's Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. I hope you'll have that open in front of you. We will read that entire passage when we get to it. Luke 10, 25 through 37, as we talk about, won't you please be my neighbor? So let's go ahead and go before God in prayer, and then we'll get right into our sermon again. Father, we thank you once again for this day, for this opportunity to be together and to be able to study the scriptures and to be able to look at these familiar passages and just look at them with new eyes, listen to them with new ears, come at them from a different angle so that we can better understand maybe today how we can apply it more to our lives. So bless us and be with us this morning as we look at this passage and as we think about the concept of being a neighbor. For we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we continue in our series this morning. We're looking at familiar biblical accounts we've all heard many times before, but I want to make sure that we are listening to them again with new and attentive ears so that we can understand. Now, why are we doing that? Because the Lord is a way of using his word to speak directly into our life at just the right time in a way that we've never heard it before. But the key is we have to be willing to listen to his word. And we have to be willing to hear it differently. John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you believe what Jesus is saying, that he is the truth, and it is the truth that you and I need in order for our life to be able to make it to heaven and be with the Father, then we need to seek out the truth of Jesus Christ. But Jesus also said these words in John 8, 32. If you hold to my teachings, that's the Bible, then you're really my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I pray that we want our future to be better. I pray that we want it to be more rooted in Christ. I pray that we want it to be more rooted in his word. However, in order to change our future, we have to know the scriptures. We have to know the lessons it teaches because they are timeless and they apply no matter where we are in the journey in our life. So true freedom, according to Jesus, comes from knowing the scripture, following what it says, but what are we free from? Well, sin, sin at large, but we can break that down into many different categories, and you've heard me say it every week, and you'll hear me say it all the way through the series, things like fear and shame and guilt, people's opinion, the culture, self-centeredness, self-pity, anger, arrogance, and I could go on with hundreds of others. But also, as we are reminded each week, there are two ways you can decide to change your future. One is to the better. That is, in other words, to hear the Word of God, allow the the Scriptures to not only change your life, but to change your thinking. And then there's the other way. Just keep doing what the world wants you to do. And your life will change, but it will only get worse. Now, that's not me saying that. That's the Word of God. It's your choice, though. You are allowed to choose whatever you want. So the question is, what are you going to do with the opportunity to change? Are you going to squander it, or are you going to use it to actually change and become what God wants you to be? So this morning, we are going to look at another familiar account. And that familiar account is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10 Verses 25 through 37, if you'll follow along with me as I read. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You answer correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed to the other side, so to a Levite. When he came to the place and saw passed to the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his donkey, and he took him to an inn to take care of him. The next day, he took two silver coins and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse 
you reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So I want to open this morning with our very first point, and that is simply this. Love the Lord. Love the Lord. Now, when you and I hear that, that phrase that we read in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, it doesn't seem all that amazing to you and I because we've grown up in the church and we have been taught this, or at least we've heard it many times. So we kind of take it for granted, but we shouldn't because you need to understand that this statement was the primary thing to the Jewish belief. It was primary to who God was and how they were to worship him. As a matter of fact, it's referred to as the Shema. Now, what is the Shema and why is it so important? Well, the Hebrew word Shema means to hear, to listen, or to obey. In other words, so why is it important to the Jews? Because in Deuteronomy, Moses implores the people of Israel to not only hear the words of God, but to listen to them. To listen to them and let them sink in that you might understand it, and then you can obey it. In other words, the Shema is a prayer that reminds them of who God is, how they are to love him, how they are to worship him, and thus they should obey him and everything that he says. So what is that prayer? Well, that prayer can be found in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, and this is what it reads. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, if you remember, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, hearing, this is what it reads, it says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, a Pharisee got up. One of them, an expert of the law, tested him on this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, you have to remember, the arrogance of the Pharisees was so tremendous that they really thought that Jesus would say one of the Ten Commandments, and then they would be able to trap him because, in other words, what they would say is, why is stealing greater than lying? that you should not lie. Why should you have no other gods be better than you should not covet? So in their arrogance, they really thought they had Jesus. But then Jesus said the Shema, the greatest commandment of all. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then he adds, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, where does he pull that from? Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Do not, re-seek, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your own people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, remember, if you, if you think back to week two in this series, we talked about a love like no other. And we talked about the first time that we were called to love our neighbor as ourselves, but by whom were we called to do that? Well, by God. In other words, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. You see, if I love the creator with everything I have, I will love the creation as well. More specifically, his children. Now, this is not unreasonable thinking at all. I want you to think about that for a moment. We already follow this principle with our friends and their children. So take it this way. So you have a person in your life that you consider to be a dear friend, but because of your relationship with them, their children already have a special status in your mind. In other words, if your friend's child would approach you with something, you would treat them with the same love and concern that you would your friend. You see, with that principle in mind, if I love God with all my heart, if I love him with all my soul, And if I love him with all my mind, then I should love his children the same way. It's a really simple principle. It's not all that difficult or deep in theological roots. See, loving God with every fiber of my being should relate to doing the best I can to accomplish his will in my life, to honor him and to praise him by living out what he has called me to live. But after the expert of the law says this, Jesus responds in Luke chapter 10, verse 28, You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But what does Jesus mean by and you will live? Well, the fact is the meaning of the word live here comes from the Hebrew word call y'all. 
call y'all, which means life given only by God. So in other words, this phrase would be easier understood saying it this way. Do this and you will live as God wants you to live. That's what it would be. So what the expert of the law does next is still something that we even do today. Luke chapter 10, verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In other words, define who I have to do this with. Tell me who I have to be kind to. Because I hate Romans. I can't stand them. I'm not very fond at all of Samaritans. And I don't like those who bother me and beg on the street. So I don't like any of those people. So tell me, who is my neighbor? Now here's the sad fact. Many Christians still do this today. We tend to look at people and deem them not to be our neighbor, don't we? Now the fact is, uh, let me go ahead and explain what I mean by that. We may not want to share, or we may know that we should, but we may not want to share the gospel with someone because it will cause us to step out of our comfort zone. But why? Why will we not do it? Well, maybe it's because we don't love them as much as we love ourselves. Now, we may want to invite somebody to church, but we don't do it. Why? Well, maybe it's because we don't love them as much as we love ourselves. We may not want to serve at church in its different capacities, whether it be kids' zone or or worship or work days or canvassing or mommy meals or helping hands meals or anything else. But why? Could it be possibly because we don't love anybody else more than we love ourselves? You see, some people, like the expert of the law, say, tell me who my neighbor is specifically. That way I can do just enough to be okay with God because I really don't feel like being put out. I don't want to go out of my way to have to do something that I don't feel like doing. But why was the expert of the law this way? Could it be that he didn't love others the way he loved himself, which, by the way, would stem from not loving God with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul. According to Jesus, the second greatest command given by God is to love your neighbor as yourself. Simply put, love God, love others. And that's this morning's going to take us to our next point. Love your neighbor. Now the Greek word for neighbor here is the word plesion. Plesion, which means any person having association with another person. In other words, anyone that you come in contact with becomes your neighbor. So, when you go to work, they're your neighbors. When you attend school, they're your neighbors. When you live by people, they're your neighbors. So this man finds out that he has a whole lot more neighbors than he actually thought, as do you and I. A whole lot more people than we actually thought. But listen to how Jesus answers his question. He answers it with a parable. Now, a parable, remember, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And this is how he answers it in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 36. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him and away, and, and, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be coming down the same road when he saw the man. He passed to the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went, went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his donkey and he took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? In other words, he's forcing him into this. Now, there are four people in the story, by the way, that I want to explain to you that you might better understand why Jesus uses this parable to make the point. Now, I want you to listen closely to each one of these people and find out if maybe you see yourself in one of them. First, there's the man. Now, the man that we're talking about is walking along the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets robbed, he's beaten pretty badly, and he's left on the side of the road for dead. But why did Jesus pick the specific road of Jerusalem to Jericho? Well, because that road, by the way, was well known to be a road of thieves and bandits. No one, by the way, ever walked that road by themselves. They never, ever did that. They never walked between the two cities that way. Why? Because the road itself was referred to and called the way of blood. 
Everybody knew what it was. That's why Jesus picked that one, because no idiot would do that. When people traveled at this time, by the way, they always traveled the caravan routes, and they usually traveled with caravan. Why? Because there was safety in numbers. So Jesus basically is pointing out that this man has made a bad decision and found himself in a very serious mess. Now let me just go ahead and stop there for one second, and let me ask you, has that ever happened to you? Has it ever happened to you that maybe you made a bad, irresponsible decision and you found yourself in a place that you did not want to be because you were walking in a spiritually unsafe route and you had chose to walk that way? And then you find yourself in a horrible mess. See, you're not walking in the responsible way of God. You're walking by your own choice and you find yourself in a spiritual mess. You wish you had never, ever taken that route. But here you are. Then there's the priest. He's a man that proclaims the message of God, whose life and work, by the way, takes place in the temple where God is worshipped. This man has studied and spoken the Shema and the words of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, love your neighbor as yourself. And yet, when he sees this man, he crosses to the other side of the road and he passes by. Now, he's just way too busy to be concerned with this situation. He has duties to perform. He cannot waste his time there. After all, this guy's the one that made the decision to walk this road. He made the bad choice. That's his fault. The priest didn't feel like dealing with it. And then there's the Levite. Now, the Levite, here's a man who is still part of the priestly family. He would have also well known his teachings as well as known what God expected of the priestly family. And this man at least walks over And he looks at the situation, but that's where his helping all stops because he also crosses over to the other side of the road and moves on. Now, maybe his reason is based in fear. It's very possible. Maybe he thought the robbers were still in the area and that he was going to be next. Or maybe he didn't want to be associated with the man that had been robbed on the road. Or maybe he didn't want people to think that he was one of the robbers. Whatever it was, he moves on and he doesn't help the guy at all in any way, shape, or form. But then comes the Samaritan. You need to remember that Jews hated Samaritans. They despised them. And the sentiment, by the way, from the Samaritans to the Jews wasn't much different. They were not very fond of each other at all. Yet when this Samaritan man comes on the scene and sees this Jewish man who had been beaten and robbed, he took pity on the man. Now, the Greek word here for pity is the word splunktizomai. Splunktizomai. That's a long word if you look up there and see it. But it's splunknizomai. And what it means is this, to show compassion and grace. By the way, to act in this way is to act in the way of God. Splunknizomai. Not only does he see and show compassion and grace to this man, but he goes to the man and he puts his own medicine on the man's wounds and wine that he pours on as well. The alcohol would have cleaned or killed some of the germs and stuff. But he puts bandages on the man, and that's not all. Then he takes the man to an inn, and he gives the innkeeper two denarii. And he says, please look after the man, and when I return, I will reimburse you for anything else that you may incur while I'm gone. Now, how much was a denarii at this time in history? It's a day's wages. So in other words, this Samaritan man gives two days wages to care for a man that he did not know. And by the way, in a normal situation, this man would not have even liked the Samaritan. And yet he gives two days wages. That's pretty amazing. So what the Samaritan does is sacrificial compassion. It is sacrificial grace. To love, to show love for another human being that you see is in desperate need of help and you reach out to them with the love of God. That shows the compassion and the grace of God. See, it's real easy, guys, to go through life and be just like the priest. It's easy to go through life and be like the Levite. You don't have time to help somebody. You don't necessarily want to bind up their spiritual wounds. You're content to say, well, they made the bad choice. They deserve what they got. Or... We get used to saying things like, listen, I know I'm a Christian and I know I really should uh, help this person because they're in desperate need of Jesus, but I don't want to be seen as a Bible thumper. I don't want to be targeted by somebody that's going to disagree with the words that come out of my mouth, so I'll just simply stay on the other side of the road and I'll keep walking by even though I know I should help out in that situation. You see, brothers and sisters, there is not going to be a neighbor at all if you're going to act like a priest or a Levite. That's nothing to do with a neighbor. That's called an inactive bystander. 
that does nothing at all. And that is someone who sees a problem and never, ever wants to be part of the solution. Now, after telling the parable, Jesus puts two choices of the neighbor in the lap of the expert of the law. And you know, you know that this man wants to say that either the priest or the Levite was the neighbor. You know he wants to. Now, why? Because that's what he's been taught all of his life. He's been taught that the priest and the Levites are much holier than anybody else. But the man also knows the law of God and what God requires of us. And so he has to answer truthfully. Consider Hosea 6, 6, for example. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Or how about Micah chapter 6, verse 8? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. And so regardless of what this man wants to say, he answers Jesus' question with a truthful answer. In Luke chapter 10, verse 36 and 37, which of these three do you think was more of a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who showed mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Which will lead us this morning to our last point. Be a neighbor. We live in a world that's a mess don't we? I mean, every one of us, we live in a world that's a mess. We all know someone, if not ourselves, we all know someone who's made some pretty bad choices in their life as to which route they are going to walk, and we find ourselves in terrible situations, and they never, ever seem to turn out good. The question is, what to do to deal with this? How do we do it? In other words, what do we do when we get there? How do we respond? I mean, we know the way we should respond, But how do we actually respond when we come to a situation like this? And this question is imperative that you and I look deep within ourselves and find the answer. Because we have to answer it. We have to answer. We know what God would say, but what do I actually do? Okay, so let's step back once again this morning. Let's think back to the parable and how it speaks to you and I today. And as we try to answer this question, how we should respond. Now, as I just said, we all know somebody, if not ourselves, who have chosen by their own mind to walk a road from Jerusalem to Jericho or the way of blood by themselves. And because of that, they find themselves in a bad situation. And what do I mean by a bad situation when I'm talking about this? Well, it could simply be a person that hasn't, has no relationship with Jesus Christ and you know that they need one. It could be a person whose life is a mess and they have no guidance whatsoever. And even though they ask you, you don't offer them scriptural advice. It could be a person that you know is searching for something in their life. They're looking for truth. And they need somebody to share it with them, but you don't do it. It could also be a Christian who has fallen away. By the way, if we only use just those four examples in your life, that's about 85% of the people that you already know. 85%. See, we have three ways that we can respond when we find a person who is in desperate need of spiritual healing. And that is the way of the three men. See, we can be like the priest. The priest who, by the way, sees the opportunity to help someone in one of these situations, but your life life is just way too busy. There are too many other things that's much more important for you to be able to slow down and take an opportunity to possibly help somebody to find eternity. I mean, why would I stop and talk to this person in front of me about Jesus? It could delay my schedule. And I've got other priorities right now that have to be done. See, the fact is, you have things that rate much higher on your priority list. So somebody else is going to have to deal with this person in your life. More, somebody that has less to do than you. But not you at all. You don't have to do this. You've got things to do. You've got people to see. You've got places to go. And that's much more important. That's the priest. Or you can act like the Levite, where you see the opportunity and the need. I mean, you take the time to even examine what's going on. But you know you can help. But instead of helping, you're more concerned with the fact of if you help out in the situation and you do it by talking about Jesus and how he has changed your life, you may be targeted by somebody who disagrees with you. You may be targeted by somebody that's not a Christian. You may be looked at not the same as you once were, and that concerns you. Actually, it scares you. So while you see the need, you've weighed the options and your concern of being targeted as a religious nut or a holier-than-thou Bible thumper concerns you so to the point that you pass on the opportunity, you go to the other side, 
and you walk on and you act like it never happened because you're more concerned with your reputation than you are anything else. Or you could respond like the Samaritan. The, the Samaritan who saw the need and he responded to it. You see, his priority list changed when he saw the man that was in a bad way. When he saw something that had to be responded to. When he saw the man who needed the attention of a godly person, this man became more important to the Samaritan than the list of duties he had to do that day. And it wasn't about being busy, by the way. His, so, and so he wasn't concerned about his schedule being messed up. The concern now became, and he wasn't concerned at all either about the fact that he might be targeted by somebody that saw that he was a follower of God. His concern became about helping this man that needed to have a godly person in his life. His concern became the welfare of a human being, human being who needed godly love, godly grace, and godly mercy. And that is the epitome of a neighbor. But what if we are the person that's been walking the way of blood? What if we're the person that's in the mess? What do we do? Well, I would encourage you to reach out to a Christian neighbor and ask them to help you. Now, listen, I want to go ahead and tell you right now, you're going to find a few Christians who are going to walk right on by you because they're priests and they're Levites. They're going to walk right on by you. They're not going to take the opportunity to help you. They may say they will, but they're not going to. Please do not assume and do not blanket statement all Christians because you know a few are going to be like that because that's just not the case at all. I promise, I promise that you have somebody who wants to be your neighbor who's in Christ and they want to help you as much as they possibly can. There are many out, here, out there today, there are many inside this body of believers right now that would love to be a neighbor to you, but just like we as neighbors need to be ready to help, you need to be ready to call out. You need to be willing to not only say, I need help, but you need to be willing to receive that help. I want to share something with you this morning that's really sad. A couple of things, actually. I actually listened to Breakpoint Radio broadcast. If you actually, uh, by the way, it's, it's actually a ministry of the Colson Center for Worldview. If you ever listen to 93.3 in the mornings, you've probably heard it before. It gives great insight to what's going on inside the culture today. But Thursday's Breakpoint segment was called Millennials and Evangelism, the Plague of Emotivism. Now, I'm going to have to be honest. When I heard that, I thought to myself, what's emotivism? I've never heard of that. Well, here's emotivism. It is the theory that moral words do not have truth value to them. They only express the feeling of the speaker. Now, let me read that one more time. Emotivism is the theory that moral words do not have truth value to them. They only express the feelings of the speaker. So what is an example of emotivism? Well, let me go ahead and say this. I could not say abortion is absolutely wrong. Why? Well, because that statement insinuates truth value, and that would, not apply, to all, that, that would apply to all people, and that's not what emotivism says is actually true. So emotivism would actually say, you should say it this way, it is my opinion that abortion's not a good thing because those are moral words and they don't really have truth. They're just expressing your feelings. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you that this is prominent on college campuses and in society today. A Barner report entitled Reviving Evangelism found that virtually every practicing American Christian believes, now listen to this, believes that part of their faith means being a witness about Jesus. Virtually all of them agree that the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to know Jesus Christ. Now that sounds like a pretty solid foundation for reviving evangelism, doesn't it? Yet in that same study, nearly half, 47% of practicing Christian millennials who go to church and consider religion to be an imperative part of their life believe that evangelism is wrong. It's wrong. They believe that it is wrong for them to share their faith with somebody to, with the intent to change what they currently believe even though they're lost. Now let me say that one more time. They believe that it is wrong to share their faith with somebody to, with the intent to change their thinking even though they're lost. Now you may be wondering, well, how in the world can a person claim to be a Christian and, and still feel it is wrong to share the gospel message with the lost in order that they might find truth? Well, the answer is actually found in a label called dissonant. Now what does dissonant mean? Dissonant means disagreeing or harsh in sound. 
In other words, if you disagree with what I believe or you sound harsh because you don't agree with me, you're dissonant, and nobody wants to be called dissonant in their life. You see, a person that's dissonant, in other words, they're so afraid of it that they will not share the gospel message, you know what that sounds a lot like? A priest and a Levite. I spoke with another young person who I've been speaking with for quite some time who wants to build their Christian worldview. But this is what they said. I feel like my life and my worldview now is more that, like that of absurdism than anything else. They were raised in a house, by the way, where, Christian, where Christianity was not a big deal. They didn't attend church, and they never talked about Jesus. So what does the word absurdism mean? It means utterly or obviously senseless, illogical or untrue, contrary to all reason or common sense, laughable, foolish, or false. Now, I want to make sure that you understand that that worldview is absolutely heartbreaking. It's sad for somebody to actually feel that life is utterly senseless, illogical, and untrue, contrary to all reason, foolish, and false. Because, you see, they have tried... The reason why that's so foolish is because they're trying to journey the way of blood all by themselves, and they have fallen prey to our adversary who will rob you of your identity. He will rob you of your moral compass. He will rob you of your self-worth. He will rob you of your dignity, and then he will leave you spiritually half dead on the side of the road to fend for yourself. How many people have we walked by in this journey that are already half dead, but we do nothing how many people do we see who really need somebody to step into their life and they're trying to make it, but we just cross the street and we walk on the other side? How many times in your life have you ever played the role of the priest or the Levite? I don't know what that answer is, but you and Jesus know what that answer is. We need to be willing to help other people to cover their spiritual wounds, to apply the medicine of the gospel message to them because the only way they're ever going to heal is that they actually meet the great physician. It's the only way. We have a world full of priests and Levites. We don't need any more priests and Levites. What we are in desperate need of is more neighbors. In the name of God, and for all that he has done for both you and me, I am asking you today to become a neighbor. Or let today be the day that you stop traveling the way of blood and get yourself to a neighbor who can get you to God. That's what I implore you to do today. So what is your decision going to be? Friends, I invite you today to accept the grace of God by faith in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary's cross and in Christian baptism, bury your old self and arise as a brand new person in Jesus, ready to become a neighbor. We don't need any more priests or Levites. We don't need people faking religion. We don't need people acting like they love Jesus but could care less about you. We don't need that. We got a whole world of them. What we need is more neighbors. That's the challenge today. You need to consider where you are and where you need to be.